Ofsted inspector David Humphreys is back at Chosen Hill, a school he inspected seven months ago. The inspection process has changed dramatically and now concentrates on senior management teams and their own self-evaluation. Hi there. Hello, Hi. morning. Good to see you again. Absolutely. Seems Shirley Bridget. Of time, it's just <laughs> nice. Hello, Shirley. Great. For this film, we've asked two inspectors to do something they don't normally do, return to schools they've recently visited. So what do head teachers need to do to get top marks? The inspectors say, take more risks in the classroom. Chosen Hill is a specialist technology college with 1,400 students on the outskirts of Gloucester. Their original Ofsted verdict was very positive, but there was one area of concern. I suppose the weaknesses, we thought, were to do with quality of teaching, which was good overall, but particularly in the sixth form and in Key Stage 4, we were seeing some outstanding teaching, innovative, imaginative, um, that was really gripping youngsters' attention, and they were responding very positively to that. What we... that was less evident in Key Stage 3. Um, I suppose teaching was, was just a little bit more mundane. We didn't think it was really building on what pupils had done in primary schools, and so there was just a sense of marking time in Key Stage 3. As a result of the report, improving the quality of Key Stage 3 teaching has been the priority for head teacher Sue Turner. You pointed us to look at slightly more imaginative ways mm. of teaching that would actually give that sort of edge. We took on the idea of the joint observations right. as a piece of work that would actually help us check mm. some of that. Now it means that our four core areas, design, maths, um, English. Uh, English and science, yeah. those four members of staff are now doing um, observations with a very different focus. Right. Um, and, and they've been working with pastoral leaders and the senior leadership team on paired observations. It should enable you to do yeah. two things. One is to, is, to, is to monitor and test out whether that's happening, but also to identify where it is happening and, and, and share that type of that's practice. Right. Oh, oh, absolutely. <laughs> David believes it's vital that teachers are encouraged to experiment more. There is an abundance of good, competent teaching. I'd love to see more inspired, um, innovative teaching that really, really grips youngsters' imagination and takes them forward into new territories. Now, sometimes you see that. It would be good to see more of it. He wants to see how the joint observations work. There's always a non-specialist, like Karen Roberts, head of English, working with the subject leader. Today, they're observing a Year 7 maths lesson. The topic is graphs. Unusually, the teacher, Matt Day, plans to spend three quarters of the lesson on a practical activity. First, a starter. What I want you to do is I want you to spend exactly 30 seconds to write down all of the places that you see graphs in real life as in all of the places you see graphs outside of a classroom. How many have you got? Two. Two. Yeah. Um, TV adverts on <laughs> Right, slow down. TV adverts, certainly. Can you think of a particular TV advert or a particular um, type of advert well, that you might see Some of them one? are like food adverts, saying how much of like one chemicals in it and... Exactly. So, is. contents of food, certainly you will do. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to do a couple of experiments to see what happens. We're then going to graph our results. And hopefully what's going to happen after that, which will probably be next lesson by then, we're going to look at the rules that go with those graphs. Many teachers are not as prepared to take a risk, particularly when other people are watching them. Um, but if they get more used to peer observation and joint observations, and the whole idea of graded observations become absolutely part of practice, then I think you take the risk. So I suppose it's becoming more open about your classroom, not just having open doors, but, but talking about what went well with colleagues and trying then to experiment together. OK. Was this held up? I didn't see that bit. You did that, did you? I didn't see that bit. OK, fair enough. More than a second or less than a second? 
less than a second. So while they are different, those gaps are pretty small. Right, that's your two minute call because the first group is finished. So that's your two minute call. Go back to your seats and sit down, leave the stuff where it is. Right, just sit down, please. What we're going to do is, we're going to have a plot of those results and see what happens. So we're going to try and produce a graph. Now what we're going to try and do is we're then going to try and see if we can find a rule, find our algebraic rule that actually works so that without doing the experiment we could find out what the extension would be, what the three periods of the pendulum would be. We can then guess and say well, what's going to happen if we put say 650 on or 612 on. So that's the direction we're going to go. So the two graphs you're going to be drawing today, the first one's going to look something like that. You've got your mass along the bottom, up to 700 grams. You can work out the scale. It needs to be at least half a page big. Because on that one, that's what I'm drawing out. Yeah. On the length, it goes up to 240. 240, right. So I need to make sure that the side, we can reach to 240. Right. And I thought 10 is probably, wait, well, I'm not sure, because I reckon it's going to be too short. But I was just checking. Can you think of a way you could have worked that out in advance? Without kind of drawing it and then having to rub it out. No, I could have just like counted up in tens. Yeah, I, I think if you think about how far you want to go and how many squares you need for each one, that would help you. Good. I think there was a conscious attempt to build on some of the things we'd said about encouraging independent learning, practical work, taking a risk, doing things in a more imaginative way. Um, so I think there has been an impact of the things we were saying to them. Where I thought he hadn't anticipated the range of competencies that pupils would have was in drawing the graphs. Do you think it should start there? Because you've gone up in two squares, haven't you? And the distance from that is also 100, but that distance there is wider. So your first one needs to be in two squares as well. Which is fine, you'll be able to rub that out, so it's in pencil. There were some who were quite confident at constructing a suitable set of axes with a sensible scale, and others were really struggling with that. I'm not clear that Matt really anticipated that being such a problem. I think what it comes back to is the the amount of time spent on practical activity. If that had been reduced and they had been drawing the graphs at an earlier stage, there would have been more scope for him to discuss issues of how do you scale the axes, what scale have you got, to support youngsters who are struggling with that and deal with their needs. OK, so plot the point, close books, face forward. The feedback will be tricky. David doesn't want to discourage Matt from doing things differently. I thought classroom management was excellent. I, I mean, I'd echo um, the strengths that Karen's just identified. I mean, it was really well organised, and with that number of youngsters in a room to undertake those sort of uh, practical activities is a sort of leap of faith, really, <laughs> that it's going to yeah. work out, and it did. I suppose, building on what Karen was saying, I, I wondered whether there was enough maths in the lesson. Um, and I feel kind of hypocritical saying that because I absolutely applaud what you did in terms of introducing a practical activity into maths yeah, and sure. to trying to relate the graphing to, to the real world and to their own experiences and, and, and to have them working independently on something. All of that was first rate. But it was only really at the end when they started to begin to plot yeah, the graphs sure. that the maths the, yes. came in. And I wondered if you might have thought about rather than everyone doing the two practical activities, half of the class doing one and half of the class doing the other, yeah, that, so they could actually then have got on with the graphing. Yeah, earlier on. Earlier on. I did think and about the mathematics of it, and 
do something like that, but it's just that the, the pendulum experiment takes so much longer than yeah. the springs, which is why I did them different to start with. Right. And I, th I think that the timing would have been, I, I take your point totally, yeah. but I do think the timing might be more difficult. Yeah. But I think, ho ho uh, hopefully, next lesson, they've got a yeah, really good it. basis now to do quite a lot of work on, right. on the things that you're talking about. Yeah. But yes, I do, I do agree. Yeah. David's keen to find out if the students have noticed any change. You say they push you more. Yeah. yeah. So, so how do they do that then? Um, well, they just keep, they keep us enter not entertainment. They keep us interested in the subject, like so it's interesting and we don't get bored with it, like after loads of lessons. What is it that makes it enjoyable? I mean, what type of things do you do in your lessons? English, maybe. Um, you go on to the internet and revise facts about Shakespeare, which we did. Right. I mean, and go, go into the library and find out lots of facts about that. Job. In English, um, like, you get to do, like, plays and stuff. You get to write the own script. Like, they give you a storyline and, like, you have to base it on the storyline. Right. But you can, like, just say, um, like, whatever you feel like, as long as it's to do with the storyline. And like you get to act it out and everything. Right. Maths are results. things are like colourful and um, a lot a lot of games are brought in. And then you think, how did I learn that? And you just kind of it, you learn without knowing it. Because like mm. I can remember doing an algebra sort of game, and then at the end he asked us some really hard questions, and I was just like, whoa, I can do it, and mm. not knowing that I've learned it really. It's been absolutely fascinating. It's also been quite heartening because I think they took very seriously the issues we raised with them in November. But when the heat of this reaction kicks Meanwhile, off, David's colleague, away, Ofsted Inspector Janet Mercer, has returned to a school she inspected six months ago. Walton High is a comprehensive in Milton Keynes with 1,300 students. Janet also wants to encourage teachers here to be more imaginative in the classroom. Well, I come from an art and design background, so I'm very fond of the notion of creativity in the classroom and, and anywhere else, really. But the idea that we should be trying out different things, and I think key to that is the ability to think of new and interesting things to do, but not to be afraid of doing it and not to worry too much if they don't quite work out. Participation, definitely. Janet's particularly keen that NQTs focus on what's actually being learned and aren't afraid to take risks. What are the sort of things that you would feel that might prevent you or, or other colleagues from Part really of doing this? Obviously, fear of failure. Mm -hmm. You don't want to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And if you do something that might lead to you making a mistake and you're not comfortable with it, mm -hmm. then you just don't want to try it. It's the class as well. You're not going to try out something that involves getting them all up and running around the class if you've got a, a group that you know it's going to take you 10, 15 minutes <coughs> to settle them down. Mm -hmm. With your teaching group, once you've tried something and it's failed, <coughs> And you kind of walk away and think, oh, that, that was terrible. Mm. How is that going to... And they come in the next lesson and they're kind of, what are we doing today, Miss? Let's carry on. They've forgotten it. You carry on. And you mm. realise that actually, what is the fallout from that at the end of the day? Yeah. I evaluated it. I wouldn't do it quite like that. I'd change these points to try mm. and make it work better next time. Um, and, and therefore, when, I think when she failed on something, or you feel personally you failed on something, but realise it's not really the end of the day, yeah, um, then, you, then you've got the confidence to remain taking those risks. That's really those important, risks. isn't it? It's, it's, it's one lesson. If it hasn't gone quite right, yeah, the world will very rarely They've forgotten it much sooner than you yeah. have, Yes, really. and I think that's important, not, not to go away and sort of beat yourself up yeah. terribly because one lesson hasn't gone as well as you hoped. And it, the worry is that people will stop taking risks or stop trying to do new things because they're too frightened of it not working. Yeah. If you try out different things with students, do you, do you check out how they respond to it? Do you ask them about their views or do you, you pick that up in other ways? But they normally offer their views, say that, you know, <laughs> this is... <laughs> you don't have to not. ask them, oh, that's really boring, or, oh, that's great, can we do that thing again that we did with the thing yeah. and that we did last time? And, and that by that you know, oh, they liked it, I'll like do it, it again. So, yeah, so you yeah. can then build on that as you get to know yeah. particular year groups and so mm -hmm. on. And I tried a starter with Year 7 that worked and didn't work with Year 8. Mm -hmm. and it was to do with the programming task where they had to know their angles, basically, 90 degrees right, 90 degrees yeah. left. So we all got up and did a line dance <laughs> with me shouting out the instructions. <laughs> worked great with Year 7, but Year 8 were like, are you mad, miss? Yeah. And it really didn't go down yeah. well with them at all. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that we've, we've talked about, so I've talked to Sharon about, that 
from from an inspectorate point of view, we focus very much on learning. And I think Sharon said that to you this morning. You say, well, actually, we watch what the, we watch what the students are doing more in a way than we watch what the teacher is doing. Mm. And I mean, clearly, those things are interlinked. One would hope, but. The, the real focus and ultimately the grade that we would award is really based on what we think students are learning and what they're getting out of it and to what extent the teaching is having an impact on that. Because mm -hmm. you might be doing an all singing, all dancing, bells and whistles job at the front and the kids are kind of switched off and there's not any impact on the learning. And equally sometimes the teaching may not seem particularly dramatic or dynamic but it's good and it's effective and the learning is, is very strong and our students are also learning from each other and there's the things like that that can happen. One of the NQTs, Anthony Smith, has agreed to be observed. So as soon as you get your books, keyword bank in the back. Can you define the uh, words from last lesson as well, please? Janet is observing the Year 9 science lesson with vice principal and non-scientist Sharon Alexander. Today what we're going to do is look at something called metal displacements. And then we're going to look at something called the reactivity series. You might have heard about this before, but we're going to look at it in a lot more detail today so that you guys can uh, completely, completely get this all in your brains for your GCSEs. And by the end of the lesson, you should all be able to tell me approximately where the metals are on the reactivity series. Can you bring yourselves so you can see what I'm going to show you over here, please? Anthony has planned a busy lesson with lots of interaction. OK, who's uh, watched the programme on Sky One called Brainiac? Hey. Oh, fantastic. OK, so you must have heard of something then called <laughs> thermite. This is what happens during the thermite reaction. Aluminium is more reactive than iron. And this ties in all with this type of thing called displacement and the reactivity series, because some metals are more reactive than others. And that's what's going to happen in this reaction. The aluminium is going to steal the oxygen and leave <coughs> iron on its own, yes? Yeah? So it's going to steal the oxygen and form iron. Sam, do you think you could tell me what that's going to be called? If this is iron oxide, that's going to be... Iron... Not iron. Aluminium oxide. Aluminium. Who said that? Go on, Lauren. Aluminium oxide. Fantastic. It's going to be aluminium oxide, yeah? Are you ready to see this? Yeah. Yes. yes. We're going to light the fuse. The fuse is going to get down into the powder. The powder is going to ignite. It's going to ignite the thermite mixture. You won't be able to take your eyes off the shower of sparks coming out the top of this. It's going to look really spectacular. Try, if you can, to look and see if you can spot this molten iron. OK? Right, the fuse is lit. I need to run off out of the way. That fuse is going to hit the magnesium powder. When it hits the powder, the thermite reaction is going to happen, aren't you? Whoa! Amazing. Oh, my eyes. <laughs> and there we go. That is the thermite reaction. And remember what I said about molten iron being formed? Watch this bit carefully. That Whoa. is molten iron, OK? Does it dumb it down so that kids understand? Well, he's good at latching into things. I think, who saw this was going to be made? Exactly, yes. Oh, yeah. I don't know what that program yeah, The no, way it obviously do. And then he used that to draw in who knows what yeah. okay, he knows about yeah. Links of things that they're interested in. Yeah, being absolutely. And he seems able to really sort of engage them. And he's just got a good delivery as well. He has. He's got a really good delivery. And, with the kids. and it's good rapport and a bit of humour. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This experiment is going to help you to decide which metals are really reactive and which metals aren't so reactive. Now, you know, you must have a rough idea as it is. You know, if I said to you, James, is gold reactive or not reactive? You're going to say it's... Not reactive. Of course it is. You know, you're not doing the dishes with a gold ring on and suddenly your finger blows off or it starts releasing hydrogen gas or something like that, is it? We know gold is not very reactive. But what we might not know is things like potassium, sodium, copper, iron, zinc, where they all fit in this series. Because they're not things that we have around us all the time, are they? I've got in my little dimple tray, and there's two stacks just at the back of the room that you need to get yourselves, is a piece of magnesium, OK? I'm going to add to it about four or five drops of copper sulphate. Now, what you need to do is make sure that you're really, really looking at this really carefully, because some of these things, they're not as spectacular as thermite, they're really, really subtle. It might just be that a little bubble of gas is given off. It might just be that as a little colour change. This one's quite obvious. Good teaching is usually fairly well planned and structured. Well, not necessarily in the form of having the 46 page lesson plan really that covers every minute of every lesson. I've seen some fairly scant lesson plans 
but it's quite clear the teachers know exactly what they're doing and at what point and has paced it well and the lesson's been very successful. Is everyone clear what I'm asking you to do? Yeah. yeah. Sure? Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Right, you need to put goggles and aprons on before you get your kit and then get on with it, please. So you as an inspector are not looking for a perfect lesson plan on a piece of paper? No, I don't really value that all that much, really. I'm not sure we're allowed to say that, is it? Um, I think it's important to understand that the planning has taken place. But I think you can usually see that in the outcome of the lesson. I'm going to give you three <laughs> lives. <laughs> If you can get to the end of this sequence without losing all three lives, then I'll bring in loads of sweets on Friday. If, however, you lose all those lives, getting down there, then you've got to bring me loads of sweets on Friday, OK? Is that a fair deal? But you can see very well-written lesson plans, enormously documented, very detailed, but actually the learning doesn't work. The teacher becomes a bit worried about deviating from the lesson plan. They want to stay very... Strict. And even when something's not quite working, they stick a bit doggedly to what they've planned because they feel they should, or they've invested a huge amount of time and effort in the planning. And sometimes it's better to go with the flow a little bit and allow things to move. And I think if I was observing in class, I wouldn't see that as a negative thing. So the first card that I'm going to turn over then, starting off, <coughs> is calcium. The plenary is unusual. Anthony's looking for active and noisy participation. Thanks to Josh. What's the next one going to be then? It's going to be higher or lower? Higher. 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 Amelia, what do you think? Higher. You think higher? Higher. OK. <laughs> We're going to go higher than iron. And the next one is aluminium. Is it higher? Yeah, yeah. It is indeed higher. Yeah. And the next one is lead. So, well done, you. Ooh, but that's like in the middle, isn't it? Lead's right in the middle. So we've got a bit of a pressure situation here because we've got... You guys have got one life left, I've got one card left, and you've got lead right in the middle. <laughs> the pressure's on, what are you going to do for? Let's do a vote. Who wants to go higher? Me. Who wants to go lower? Me. OK, higher. Well, just me, everyone said it. Higher than lead, yes? So something really, really reactive. It shall. Something really, really reactive like... No. I told you! That wasn't my fault. I told you it was silver. Get all your books together, please, and stand behind your places so I know you're ready to go. Leave your books here and then off you go, please. How do you think it went? What's your feedback It was feedback excellent. The uh, only thing I was slightly disappointed about is the timing, cos I wanted to get the worksheet in rather than set it for homework, but that's not right. a problem. But okay. Apart from that, yeah, I thought it went quite well. Went really well. Yeah. One of the things we talked about when we were setting this up um, was, was to what extent teachers take risks in their lessons. Now, for a non-scientist, I thought you took an awful lot of risks. In terms of a, a normal Year 9 lesson, how was that for you? Um, yeah, the sort of, like, the bit that I've done differently is obviously the plenary with the sort of, like, the play your cards, I think, because, like, obviously a lot of people aren't really comfortable with having like 30 kids like, screaming and shouting here. Like, a lot of people sort of like, right, you must stay quiet, but I'd rather like, get them up and get them active because it is the uh, last lesson before break, so I'm not sending them on to another colleague, like hyperactive. I'm only sending them out to go and expend a bit of energy right. at break. OK, that, that's actually that's a really good thought, the fact that it is going into break time. Does that make you differentiate what you do? Yeah, definitely. I wouldn't, do that. I wouldn't do that session one because that's not fair to send them then on right. to another class. That sort of that, that oh, hyper. I thought there was been a particularly good rapport with students. There was a good use of humour, which just establishes, I think, a, 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 a good, uh, pleasant, and comfortable learning environment for students. That, that they were in, they were, and they were enjoying things. When you, when you, so are you ready for this? You know, there was enthusiasm there. I think for many teachers, as you said, your plenary would be a huge risk. Yes, it would. You know, getting them <laughs> shouting out, and you could get them to stop. You know, yeah. like that. You didn't have to shout. You didn't. Mm. You know wave a pen or stand on a chair or and and I think that's a real mm. credit and, mm. and again it's, it's how do we now share that mm. how do we share that good practice mm. there's a bit of that I didn't teach you, you need to have a lot of confidence in what you're doing yourself mm. and in your confidence of working with the group to be able to let go yes that's the, I yeah. think if, you, if you're not confident about that then that's what the tendency is to try and control it isn't it to mm. to always be in charge and to always manage the thing very very tightly yeah. And you might be frightened of letting go, because you might not get it back again. So, so I would grade that as an outstanding oh. lesson. So would I. Oh, excellent. <laughs>
No, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Back at Chosen Hill, David is reporting to the senior management team. It's been a short flying visit, but I think I have managed to glean some sense of where you are and how you've moved forward, and a few words may help you um, go further in the future. We talked in November about innovative, imaginative teaching, stimulating their interest and trying to spread that more across the school and, and, and build on best practice. I think there are signs of that beginning to happen. Um, we saw some practical work in a maths lesson. Um, and pupils also talk about practical work, inevitably in things like science and DT, but also in other subjects. They are all able to tell us about activities they've done that have risen above the mundane, that have involved some more imaginative activities, um, involved them being more actively engaged in their learning. I think the joint observations you're doing clearly have, have enormous potential. Um, I think the model where we were talking earlier with Karen about where you've got a skilled practitioner who's practised in observation and giving feedback, working alongside someone who's a subject specialist, because you mustn't lose sight of, of that strand, to develop their skills. Um, I think that's well designed to, to push forward and develop that type of ability to self-evaluate at a subject level. Sure, to some extent you can do it from on high, but what you really want to get is a culture and an ethos where it's happening um, at a departmental, at a subject level. So I think what you're doing there is, is good. Which does take us to the I word, uh, impact, impact, impact. Um, and I think clearly observation is a way of, 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 of getting at the impact of your actions. What do your observations tell you about the overall quality of teaching and learning? Is it moving on? If you do sequences of observations now and in a year's time, is the overall quality of teaching in the school higher than it was? The message to teachers from the Ofsted inspectors is keep trying out new ideas, even if they don't always come off. I don't want to see teachers being put off and think, oh, well, I can't try that again because it didn't work. It's not going to damage the life chances of those children because one lesson didn't work out. Whereas non-exciting, dull, sort of pedestrian type of teaching day in, day out isn't really going to switch them on to learning very much. <laughs>